Okay, um, well thank you guys for joining us for the last session of the day. We're gonna kinda, we're gonna keep it engaging and exciting because I know it's the post-lunch slump right now, so, and I'm standing between you and your evening. Uh, but I think this is a really exciting panel for us to end the day with because it'll really tie together some of the key themes that we were talking about all day today and tee us up for the discussion for tomorrow. Um, so this is the uncertain water future discussion, and it's quite broad. It's going to give us a, a really good opportunity to think about moving forward, how do we uh, adapt to changes in our water resources, but also what are some of the key elements and factors that will play a, a huge role in adapting and, and mitigating future issues with our water resources. Um, on our panel today, and I'm going to let them all introduce themselves and give a few thoughts, um, but let me just do a, a quick overview of who we have today. Uh, Steven Schoenberger, who's the practice manager for water in, a, in agriculture at the World Bank, particularly in the North Africa and Middle East region. Um, Professor Kenneth Stresspeck, who is an MIT Science and Policy Global Program Director, but also a professor of over 30 years. Um, Marshall Motsino. Need to know. Need, need to, to know. <laughs> need to know. Yeah. Uh, who is the co-founder of Upstream Tech, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, and then as well, Rochelle Young, who is the co-founder and CEO of Mammoth Trading. So I'm going to turn it over to my panelists. They're each going to give about five minutes of an introduction, and then we'll get into some of the questions, and then again, of course, end with some Q&A. So let's start with Professor Stresspeck. Oh, OK, thank you. Good afternoon. So this is a, a pleasure to be with you all today. And I come with um, a number of different backgrounds. One is I'm here at MIT returning from where I did my initial training in water resources and now affiliated with the, uh, the joint program on the science and policy of global change. And then also affiliated with the uh, Jamil Water and Food um, Security Center. Um, as well as um, being involved um, also with the World Bank on a number of projects, particularly in Africa, related to climate change and water resources. And so I work on two scales, global, global scale issues and then water resources, what river basin to local scale issues. And as I think about what is um, uncertainty, we have major uncertainties at all of those levels. And they fall into what, what I talked about is about four different categories. The main one being demand. And as we do our global studies and look for hotspots around the world, the key thing related is global change, even more than climate change, which is something we do quite a bit of. But if you look at Asia and some of the recent work we've done, the growing demands for water due to population and economic growth far outweigh the changes that might occur in terms of climate change. And so we need to be dealing with those issues and looking at the uncertainties that are in economics and population and our drivers. The other key thing in terms of water resources is the rapid urbanization. And generally, urbanization means somewhere on the order of five to 10 times more water per capita as people move from rural to urban regions. And how do we provide that, that water? And will we do it in a different way? Or we do it, do it in um, the business as usual? The other really important issue is water in demand, water for ecosystems or water for nature, as some call about it. Um, in a recent study, if we take all of the um, irrigated areas of the world and were to give back to nature one of the lower standards of environmental flows, 18% of all irrigated agriculture would lose its water. And that's not even a dramatic move. If we know in the Colorado, less than 1% of the water goes to the sea. And if that were to change, what would that mean for agricultural production and for food? And then the other thing is, what is going to happen with food production? And you need to come and listen to Mark Rosegrant and the others tomorrow afternoon on food, because uh, how do we feed the planet? Is it going to be rain fed? Is it going to be irrigated? What are the differences there? What are we going to want to use water for? Are we going to use it for um, biofuels? Are we going to use it for clean energy and hydropower? Are we going to use it for producing um, uh, product. Um, so, and what is the role of rain fed? The other issue as we look at supply is what is sustainable surface water use? 
How do we define that? How do we define sustainable groundwater use? Do we exploit the fossil aquifers? And if you talk to an economist versus others, what is sustainable as we lift that water out not to be returned for a thousand years? How do we use that? And then finally, um, as we look at that, that all fits within institutions. How are we going to govern water? Um, and particularly, um, there's been a mantra since the Dublin time called integrated water resource management. And if you have a session on that, we'll get four people with four different opinions, and three of the four usually it has failed because it's set up a framework, but it hasn't been funded and hasn't been implemented, so people think it's functioning, and we are having problems because of that. So we have to really look forward how our institutions are moving and how do we bring in things related to um, what we do. And then finally, the whole idea of climate change is having a massive effect both on um, warming is going to lead for more demand for irrigation, but then how does that affect um, water supply and where, where and how? Because it's different by space and at time. And particularly, we're seeing it more now in terms of extreme events. And are we ready for that? And our big, our big change is flooding. We have not prepared for flooding. And how will we go forward? So what are we doing in our responses? Are we going to trust on technology? What do they have out there? Are we going to trust on legal and institutional aspects? Or are we going to trust on behavioral changes of the North and the South and, and those aspects? So I'm excited to be here and hear my, my colleagues on the panel. Um, should I go next? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, Rochelle has given us the opportunity to put up a PowerPoint slide, but I'm afraid I'm a recovering PowerPoint addict. <laughs> and I'll let you know how that happened. Uh, I was uh, in Yemen before the, the fighting broke out, and uh, I was giving a presentation on issues of water. And Yemen, as you've probably heard, is one of the most water-stressed places on Earth. And we were talking about the different options they had to deal with that in terms of technologies and policies and all that. And, and we were in this little hotel in downtown Sana'a. And then suddenly the whole room shook, and then we heard automatic fire, and it was uh, very tragically there was this major Al Qaeda um, uh, attack on a hospital, or a military base about a block away, and you know the guns were going off, and the, the explosions and everything else, and I kept going with my PowerPoint, and the people were listening to it, and so I kept going and going, and my young colleague who was you know clicking the slides was looking at me with very big eyes, like what the hell are you doing? <laughs> And you know, I was so determined to get that darn PowerPoint presented that I just kept going right till the end, you know? And at that point <laughs> afterwards, uh, he confronted me and told me I needed help. And so I do not do PowerPoints anymore. I'm in recovery. I have Fair. a support group at the World Bank. And it should be a big support group. It's a small one because most World Bankers still maintain their addiction. But what I'll do is um, I'll just real quickly uh, talk through a little bit the World Bank and in this space, just because uh, I think probably many people know about us, but you never know. Um, so I mean, we are a bank. So you know, our most obvious uh, thing is to lend money to countries to do projects or to finance policy changes, et cetera. In the space of water and agriculture, we finance a little over $6 billion of projects, uh, 25 projects in a, in a number of countries. We have about another $3 billion that are in preparation. That $6 billion or so represents about 10% of the total lending that the World Bank does right now. And so it's an important part, but you know, not the most important part per se. Um, within the World Bank, you know, again, our, our focus is on lending. But then our president, Jim Kim, a few years ago, when he came on board, he said, listen, I was, I'm not part of this institution. And when I look at the World Bank, actually, I didn't look at your lending. I looked at the knowledge products you put out there. And when I talk to people, what they expect you to do is bring global knowledge. So we need to put much more emphasis on global knowledge. So we formed these global practices to really facilitate the flow of knowledge so it wasn't bottled up region by region. And within that, we, we created yet another thing called global solution groups. And in the area of water, one of them is water in agriculture. It was water for agriculture, but we changed it to water in agriculture. And I think that's important based on what we've heard throughout the day, which is it's not about how you get more water in, in, into agriculture. It's how agriculture plays its part in, in the overall water space. And that was the emphasis we wanted to make with the change in name. Uh, so what are the three? There are three big areas within this solution group. There are many things we're doing in the World Bank. There's 14,000 people, so you can imagine everything's happening. But three priorities we've put on our work in this space. 
Uh, the first is global advocacy and then operationalization of this whole concept of agricultural water stewardship. And you heard some of the best people on that earlier. There's more on the panel tomorrow. But it's really, again, how does agriculture come to the table, not as the one trying to protect its allocation, but as part, a constructive part of the conversation on the overall challenge of managing water at a basin level, a country level, whatever the, the scale is that, that you want. And to do that, what are we looking at? Three things. One. Uh, water accounting as a key part. I think someone mentioned it earlier. Bringing water accounting as a standard tool when we're doing irrigation work, you know, what's happening more broadly in terms of the surface water, the groundwater, the flows, et cetera, the different demands on, on, on the system. Easier said than done, but it's something we're trying to figure out what's the appropriate approach that can work with the developing country clients we have. Uh, secondly, indicators to monitor how water is being used in agriculture. Sounds simple. You want to get a real exciting debate going in the World Bank amongst our group, talk about crop per drop or water productivity. It's an endless discussion about what are the proper numerators and denominators from a methodological view, et cetera. We have a paper that will come out hopefully in about a month on that. But you know, this is a big deal. But we need those indicators globally and at the country level and the local level and even the farmer level. And again, there's a lot of different views on how that's done. And then finally, something that really came up in the last panel is reflows which is you know, what happens to the water. Agriculture uses, well, it, it withdraws about 80%, but it's by far the highest consumptive user. And I was kind of interested that this distinction between withdrawals or, and, 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 and application and consumption didn't come up as strongly as it could have. I think Chandra made some uh, allusions to it in his presentation. That's a really important difference. But what's interesting is even though agriculture uses 50, 60, 70, 80% goes in consumptive use, what's left over is a really a lot of water. Because remember, it's starting from a fraction of 80% or so. And so how that water goes back into the system matters in terms of its quantity, its quality, and its location. So that's something we, at least, it's obviously the last panel mentioned. There's a huge body of work on that in the US, Europe, other places, Australia. It's not really part of the development and water agenda. It's something we're trying to put there. The second big area is institutions. Uh, you know, Irrigation has evolved extraordinarily in terms of technology. You now have pressurized systems, high demands in terms of service quality for farmers growing fancy crops. Um, you know, the, the institutions that manage irrigation aren't often up to it. And then you've got these new demands on them to actually work as water stewards, water managers, worry about water quality. So how do these institutions have to evolve in developing countries in order to take on all of those uh, responsibilities and, and deliver effectively. And last is, is a more sort of parochial view or focus is in the context of irrigation expansion. Again, I go back to Chandra's uh, keynote. You know, Africa is where there's clearly going to be an expansion in irrigation. Hopefully, Mark tomorrow will talk about some of IFPRI's work, which really emphasizes the important role of, of small scale, distributed, individualized, private. Farmer-led, whatever you want to call it, irrigation community as well as, uh, but away from the big systems, and really, how do those systems evolve and grow and spread in a way that's uh, inclusive uh, for the, you know everybody? Because it's a private sector-driven thing, but you know, do we want women, youth, poor people to be left out? No. So how do we deal with that? And secondly, the sustainability issue, because even though you're privatizing and individualizing the technology and the, and the pumping of water and its application, you still have a shared resource, as we've heard all day. So how do you get people to do the collective action around that? So that's basically what we're focusing on. And what I'm hoping out of coming here is that some of you will be intrigued enough to come and work with us as well. And if you are interested, let me know. <laughs> Marshall. Thank you. Uh, I'm Marshall. Uh, I was lucky enough uh, after graduating at Tufts to work at a number of early stage startups. Uh, but those startups didn't have uh, any impact, really. We were taking a lot of data, figuring out some insight about that data. Uh, but it was like for marketing purposes or you know, helping developers make their code better. And so I had a crisis a few years ago where it was like, my work, the stuff I'm doing every day is not having a tangible impact. Uh, so my co-founder and I started Upstream Tech, uh, and we realized our skill set that we had developed at these companies where we take lots of data, um, use machine learning, and give some actionable answer was really applicable in water, right? You have stream gauges measuring every couple seconds. You have petabytes of satellite information. Um, and so we took that and created a company where we take every satellite image from you know, 50-something satellites, combine them, 
into data that we can process, use machine learning on that data. And we're actually able to uh, tell you things about irrigation. We're able to find different crop types. We're able to identify sites that are suitable for hydropower. And we're working with uh, the Nature Conservancy, the Freshwater Trust, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, and, and energy uh, companies that do restorative hydro, so hydro that uh, doesn't require damming and is actually uh, building habitat and recharging groundwater. Um, so it's been successful, and we're now scaling uh, what we're doing. And uh, hopefully, my perspective from technology can help with this panel. My name is Rochelle Young, and um, I would say that I'm a recovering engineer. These days, I'm a water resources economist. Um, I was in graduate school, and um, it was as part of that program that I was really pushed into the field and started uh, working a lot with agricultural producers. Um, I found that I was a lot better at talking to farmers than I was at research. And so I ended up uh, starting a company called Mammoth Trading. Um, and we believe that good water management is the product of informed and engaged stakeholders, um, as well as inf uh, thoughtful and science-based policy. Uh, and so to the grad students and undergraduates in the room, I'd say that if you haven't yet talked to stakeholders of your research or the people whose lives that you wish to affect in the world, um, you know, get out of the lab, get out of the classroom, and go talk to those individuals. Because I think that a lot of times in school, we're um, sort of given problem statements. So you know, we're, as uh, engineers or economists or you know, whatever your background is, we're given the problem statement from the beginning. Uh, but never, in our task is then to solve that problem with a number of different constraints. And so I think that it's really important to go out into the world and first discover what that problem really is. Um, you know, I certainly found that my research, my first thesis topic didn't matter to a single person that I talked to. Um, and so I tossed that out the window and decided that I would start from scratch uh, with an issue that actually did matter to the agricultural community. Um, so now I will get off my soapbox. Um, I, you know, we talked a little bit, I've, we've had a bit of discussion about water markets today, and that is um, an area that uh, I have expertise in. I want to take us a few steps back and talk about what water markets are and what they're not. Certainly in the Western United States and across the planet, we have uh, a history of overappropriation, and uh, this is exacerbated by drought and climate change, which means that in many years, uh, there are individuals and needs for water um, where they go without. And the results of that can be disproportionate, unfair, and financially devastating or devastating to ecosystems and communi communities. Um, there are increasingly uh, uh, communities that are using tools to reallocate those water resources. And these are called water markets. They are voluntary um, uh, tools where people can decide where water is most needed and most valuable within their community. Um, they often uh, emerge organically. So a lot of people talk about, oh, well, we should just import the Australian uh, system of water markets to the United States. Um, but I'd push back and say that there are actually many different kinds of water markets that function very, very well, and that we don't need to reform the water rights. But look at the local institutions, the local hydrology, the local community needs, and see how those water markets are working, and perhaps how we can uh, improve them in ways that maybe they're not functional, functioning most optimally. Um, there are a range of um, uh, formality. Uh, or there's a range of formality of water markets. Sometimes they're highly informal. So if you look at uh, irrigation districts or uh, uh, these systems of ATM debit cards in China, these are highly informal systems that, uh, where people are uh, buying and selling the rights to irrigate or to use water. Then there are more formal systems um, like Australia or the many systems of uh, groundwater trading that exist in uh, Texas, so the Edwards uh, Aquifer. Um, or you have uh, the ne Nebraska Natural Resources Districts. Um, so there, there's a range of formality there. Um, there are a range of the types of individuals that uh, trade. And so you know, I'd uh, challenge us all to sort of expand our minds on what, uh, what is included when we talk about water markets um, and perhaps think about different ways that uh, we can improve these kinds of things, scale them, um, maybe make them more accessible to people. 
Um, but certainly, water markets depend uh, critically on good governance. And so even with the most, these are challenges both for uh, developing nations and for developed nations. And so if you look at um, some of the recent scandals coming out of uh, the Murray-Darling Basin in Australia, here we have the most active water uh, market in the world, um, and one that everyone points to as the model, and yet you have huge issues of corruption and theft and people buying what's called, the, sorry, people, um, the uh, government using taxpayer dollars to buy uh, what's called ghost water or water that is on the books, but doesn't represent real water in the system. So there are ways in which we need to improve our governance, our accounting systems, um, and so that's uh, more of what we can uh, certainly talk about today. Great, thank you all. Um, very quickly, I realized that I forgot to introduce myself. Um, so I'm Janelle Heslop, I'm an MIT graduate student pursuing a master's in civil and environmental engineering as well as an MBA. Um, for the past several years, I was working as an environmental consultant in the water utility sector. Um, so I think you guys have all laid a fantastic foundation for a number of the different angles that we wanna talk about today. But before we get into maybe perhaps talking about some of the solutions, I'd like to lay a groundwork for what we mean when we say uncertain water future. What does that look like? How uncertain are we? Where is some of the certainty over what time horizons? So first I wanna actually pass it to Professor Stresspeck. Um, if you could share a little bit more about some of those key themes that you talked about, demand, um, urbanization, climate change, what, what do we actually not know? What do we know? Over what time frame will they occur? And then maybe the rest of you can also share a little bit more about how you're thinking about what changes will happen to our water, water resources in the long, short and long term. Okay, no dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the the issue is, um, and I, I think it was wonderfully complimented by my colleagues on the panel, and you, you spread it out. In terms of demand, it's about governance, it's about economics, and since we're sitting at MIT, it's about technology at some level, but technology is not going to drive it. It's going to be a, a an activity that we can use and apply, but it's, 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 not, it's not the real, um, thing that's good, that's what's uncertain. We may get some big changes if uh, if we get some major reductions in costs in um, in desal, or we get some major changes in the ag field, particularly in rain-fed agriculture. That will have a big um, a, a big change on on what we do. So I think that's. But we look at climate change. We have to see what that means, and we're already seeing it. Is generally one degree C leads to about depend where you are between four and 7% increase in water demand. So if we at the end of the century are four degrees warmer on average globally, but eight and nine degrees over the growing season in some of the developing countries, that's a lot of water. Um, a big uncertainty is what is the CO2 fertilization effect gonna be? There's lots of debates on that. It changes the sign in Africa on a number of the crops on whether climate change is good or bad and how we re respond on that. So in terms of these issues of of how do we deal with that? And then the other things are these institutions that we're talking about climate change affecting uh, the yields, where some yields in many African countries, what are 20 to 30% of world yields. So um, how do we make that changes? And that's one of the things the bank is working on. How do we make those, those changes? So in terms of demand, there's lots of activities there. But the big thing in terms of supply is the climate models all are pretty, close on telling us what the temperature is going to do if we know the emissions. But there's 22 major models out there. And if you look at Southern Africa, they give you a, um, about 60% of them are saying drying and 40% are saying warming. And you cannot put a skill on which one is correct. There's what's called model um, and structural uncertainty in those models. So we are going forward um, very in a vague clouded place with sunglasses on and what do we do as we move forward with very dramatic things where we can make wrong choices and have stranded assets or very damaging impacts if we don't respond to them. So this uncertainty, um, we'll, we'll talk about later in terms of how do we respond and there's are some ways we're responding to that. But I think these uncertainties both in what's going to be the, the, uh, the climate policy that we're seeing, what is the impact of us potentially pulling out of Paris? Are we going to be on 8.5, 4.5? There's very big changes on those impacts on the agriculture and on the, on the water systems as we move forward. And what are those adaptations? And one of the big questions is we need to look at things systemically. 
because we look at adaptations, the ag sector wants the water to adapt, the energy sector wants the water to adapt, the environment needs more water if you have mangroves or other things that, that evaporate water. So we're coming to these, um, these uh, crisis points, and I can't agree more, it's about governance and being ready for that. We're not ready in the Colorado River for climate change, since the upper basin has to provide 8.5 um, mil million acre feet per year it's in law. So what if they only have seven now because of climate change? How do we deal with that? So we have to bring law, we have to bring institutions. And again, I think if you're in the water world, technology is great, but you have to learn about institutions and law and governance as, as you work out there in policy. Others? Going down? Uh, so I, I'm a real optimist on the supply side going forward. I think you know, we see people in this room, um, Raquel, Marshall, all innovators in how to deal with the supply side, whether it's reallocation or new ways of understanding how water works. All of you in this room are, are dedicated to this. And we've seen that you know, when people decide they care about the issue of water, things, interesting things happen. Per capita water use has gone down a lot in most European countries. Um, technologies, building codes, da, 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 da. So all of that is fine. That's, I'm very optimistic about. Humans adapt. They change behavior, et cetera, et cetera. I'm much more concerned about the demand side, how quickly we, people, the, the, the planet and different parts of the planet will come to grips with the fact that there is the uncertainty from a climatic perspective and the downsides are so much, so serious that we can't afford not to act as if there's a good chance they'll happen. Uh, just structural uh, scarcity because of population growth. Uh, you know, people, there's a lot of political, uh, unwillingness to take on these issues because they require asking people to make sacrifices or change their behavior or invest money in things, et cetera. And, there's a, and, and that, how long can that resistance go before we finally say, okay, now we're gonna deal with it? And I think that's the sort of the future I see is in terms of uncertainty is when will the demand side say, okay, we really do have to take this on seriously. We have to make the sacrifices. And as I said, when, when that happens, you see amazing things happen in technology, in policies, and in individual behaviors. But until that happens, uh, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, the, the, in, in the Gulf countries, I, I work with a lot of young Gulf uh, graduates from Kuwait, et cetera. They really are not aware, they told me, they're not aware that their water situation is as dire as it is. And it's, you know, it sounds obvious, but they said, listen, it's never brought to our attention. It's never an issue. It's not part of the national debate. You know, so we, you know, I guess governments figure they can desal their way out of it. Uh, they can't. I mean, not in the long term. They're, they're overdrawing their aquifers like crazy, and they're in the midst of this theme of this conference. They're stuck in this, what do we do with food security using the aquifers, et cetera. So you know, until the governments and society at large sort of say, okay, we really want to take this on, the uncertainty is great. Right. Go for Real it, quick. Rachel. I, yeah. Just where I, uh, technology is by no means the answer, but we are trying to decrease the uncertainty, right? Because uncertainty is risk and risk is costly. And to understand or have a slightly better understanding of what might happen or what is happening and what is working uh, is extremely valuable. And so to create tools that make folks like you more effective at what you do and take the successes you've had and scale them, um, that's really what we're trying to do, right? So for example, the uncertainty that groups we've worked with um, they, a group, the Columbia Basin Water Transaction Program run by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. They will pay farmers to, um, for a season, leave the water in stream for environmental benefits. And their uncertainty was whether or not this program was working and whether or not the farmers were actually not growing anything. And so the way they dealt with that is by driving to the farm fields, getting out of the car, looking at the ground, saying, looks pretty brown and dry, you must not be using your water, getting back in the car and driving 100 miles back to the office. And this program, which had success, couldn't scale because they were, doing, they were uh, mitigating uncertainty very manually. And to take that and convert it to a technological process where we just automatically take satellites, use machine learning to figure out if the land is irrigated, they can just look at their entire program and see what's working and what's not working. And so now they're expanding into California because they've saved so much money around monitoring that they can afford to 
take that success and expand it into a new region. So I think by addressing uncertainty and taking existing successes and trying to decrease the certain uncertainty so that we can scale those successes into new places, I think that's, uh, that's an exciting opportunity. Yeah. I'll just add that uh, drought risk and climate change are also huge business risks. So when we think about how the 2012 drought in the High Plains affected uh, agricultural producers, it meant that they were pumping usually uh, one and a half times to two times the amount that they normally would to keep their crops dry or to keep their tr crops irrigated, and sometimes that wasn't enough. And so you get a huge amount of uh, crop failure, which re represents a huge amount of loss. Um, then there are, you look at the multi year drought in California. Same kind of story where so much pumping happened uh, across the Central Valley that you had not only businesses that had to continually invest in uh, deeper and bigger wells, uh, which was a huge financial cost, um, but they also were dealing with uh, you know, shortages in, in surface water supplies, um, having to uh, take out some of their perennial crops that they were losing. Um, you had uh, damage to surface level infrastructure like your roads, canals, uh, pipes, and so you know, I think that in addition to thinking about the kind of risk that we face uh, as, a, as a nation or um, sort of uh, as a global society, that we can also think of uh, drought risk as being a business risk too. So how can we think about ways that we can decrease that risk for uh, our agricultural producers? That's great. That, that's led us right to my next question, which is what is the impact of this uncertainty on the global food system or on the agricultural sector? And as each of you have kind of said, what is the agricultural sector's impact on this uncertainty, right? So um, does anyone want to take that? Uh, the easy one, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> we, can also, we can also add in there what, what are the differences between developed and developing nations and how it might impact those nations differently. You know, the more I, I go out, and recently I was out in Nebraska looking at the NRDCs, which have been mentioned a few times uh, by Raquel and others, and uh, the differences aren't that great. I mean, the resources available to people to respond are a bit different, but, you know, farmers are farmers. I mean, they're, they're, they're good at what they do. They're, they're trying to manage risk. They're, they're trying to make a living out of the land. So, so I, I don't find that part to be hugely different. Obviously, the institutional side that can sort of folks on the governance side is very different, so they're given uh, maybe some more tools to work with in the US and in the developing country, but the fundamental issues are the same. Uh, let, me, let me just silo a little bit, because I wanted to share, uh, trying to, uh, a few people mentioned a report that came out um, recently uh, uh, that we, we did on, on big pictures on, on water, and, and, and it sort of follows on this issue that, um, just to sort of give a sense of the magnitude, when there's uncertainty or when there's uh, variabil high variability in, in rainfall and, and in ability to produce food, um, we, we took the demogra demographic household survey data from a number of developing countries, uh, combined that with uh, other household survey data and uh, weather data, et cetera, and using a lot of econometrics, we came up with what we think are pretty convincing stories, um, which a colleague of mine calls where drought is destiny, where it, it, it shows that, uh, it purports to show that uh, a woman born during an extreme drought year is much more likely to be stunted, okay? Food availability is lower. As a result, and we all know that one of the horrible tragedies of stunting uh, in the first 100 days uh, due to malnutrition is you know, long-term uh, uh, cognitive uh, problems. So she's likely to do less well in school, have less schooling, eventually have less wealth. And the most worrisome thing about that is the evidence shows that it gets transmitted intergenerationally. So because of the challenges she faces, some of that gets transmitted to her children. So a bad drought year, can you imagine, affects two, three generations in a poor country. And that's, that's mind boggling. I, that's, and so I think that is maybe the big issue uh, that we face is, is uh, how do we help to make sure that when there are these major weather events, and by the way, droughts are much more serious than floods, although we talk about floods much more. Uh, 
how do we really start to build more resilience to that? And it's going to be a combination of what's been mentioned before, better sort of more drought resistance crops, but it'll also be bringing water to agriculture through uh, either individualized or, or, or public irrigation systems uh, so that these types of events don't cause the kind of long-term impacts that, that, that we, we see. So I think it's really about, you know, yes, we do need to bring more water to, more water management to agriculture, not necessarily more water, but the management of water has to improve. So maybe we can start to shift towards solutions and, and talking and exploring what the key elements are in, in mitigating that risk. Um, so I do want to explore sort of every sector here because we do have quite a diversity of experience up here. So maybe we can start with looking at uh, technology and then also move then to policy and economics. What's the role that technology can play in helping us to mitigate the uncertain water future? I think there's a low hanging fruit. We've been amassing data that's been a theme for the past decade. Everyone's just like, collect your data. Uh, and, but not a lot is being done with it. Um, so petabytes of satellite information only recently was, or only recently are there tons of companies taking that and doing large scale automated processing. Um, you look at the stream gauge data that USGS puts out, and we still don't have a great way to predict uh, stream flow based on uh, the conditions at the beginning of a year. Um, so I just think there are, there are these warehouses, massive warehouses of data. Um, and I think it takes one person with a slight cross-discipline approach of like, oh, I know water and I know a little bit of technology. I can take this data that not people haven't been looking at or have been overlooking. And that answers this really important question. Um, so I think that's a, a low-hanging fruit. And I think um, as more groups start to partner, um, and, and share that, that information. Um, you know, the, if, if a group like the Nature Conservancy partners with a startup and gives them a whole host of information that they've been you know, writing down in Excel spreadsheets for a decade, like that data is now going to uh, automate that entire process that the Nature Conservancy has been doing. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for that. Um, so I think in terms of technology, they're at a couple different scales. And, and to go along with you is the whole uh, revolution of cell phones in the internet for management of agriculture in Africa. And there's been a lot of work going on there in getting information on weather in crops and things to, to the farmers interacting there. So that's, I think that's very important. And then as the, the climate modelers, the weather modelers are getting better, the, the forecasts, the 13 year month forecast is getting better um, as we do better in doing those modelings to help us uh, plan for that at, this, at that scale. And the other thing is a bigger issue of infrastructure, which we'll talk about all of the civil infrastructure, um, led by Professor Denuffel here at, at MIT, is the idea of flexible design. So part of the things of some of our decisions have different temporal scales, and the infrastructures we build have different lifetimes. So agriculture, you can change your crops, although sometimes you have to buy equipment, which will wear out. So the life of your decision may be the, the 10 or 20 years of your equipment. But reservoirs have lives of 100 years. Bridges have lives of 50 or 100 years. As we make those longer term ones, we have to look at where we're going to be. And we really don't know on many of our extreme events and things at that scale. So making our decisions with flexibility, building dams that can be expanded, um, building irrigation systems that we leave a buffer so if we have to expand the canal, we're not having uh, impact there. Those kinds of things as we build roads, et cetera. So bringing flexibility in through management and bringing technology into that with sensors, all of those different things can help us um, as we move forward. But there's some bigger issues here, which we'll talk a little bit later, is about the whole thing of economic growth and sustainability has an impact um, depending on if you're in the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Water, or the Ministry of Finance. And that has big impacts, which we'll come to later. That's a really good point about you know, connected decisions. Um, right now, some decisions are being made siloed. So I'm going to change my uh, management practice of this farm. Um, but it doesn't take into account all of the upstream and downstream ramifications of that change. Um, right? If we switched every single uh, irrigation system to on what on paper looks very efficient, drip irrigation, the return flows may you know, create really bad effects downstream. Hydropower may stop generating uh, energy. 
uh, you know, species may not have enough water to spawn. So there are all of these connected decisions. And uh, unfortunately, it's hard as a human to keep all of it in your head at once while you're making a decision. So I think leaning on technology is really important in that case. Uh, I don't know if this is just me, but there, so for me, there were very few lectures that really stood out in my mind uh, when I sort of think back on my undergraduate and graduate career. I don't know. <laughs> so if anyone like really remembers lectures, then um, you're a better person than I am. Uh, but I remember so clearly um, one lecture from an economics professor of mine who had later become uh, my co-founder at Mammoth. Um, his name is Nick Brazovich, and I was sitting in this freshman level economics class. And uh, he announced this startling fact that we know more about the surface of Mars. We have better resolution on the surf about the surface of Mars than we do about groundwater use in our country. That is startling. And so I think that there are many ways in which we can make um, huge improvements in the kinds of data that we collect about uh, groundwater use in our country. Um, this is fairly low hanging fruit. Um, you know, one of the panelists earlier had talked about how uh, sometimes farmers irrigate because water is available, but not because um, it necessarily makes financial sense. Um, sometimes you have, there's data available about your energy use and about your water use, but they haven't been combined in new ways that could tell you, is it cost effective to irrigate right now? And so I think that there are these kinds of tools where, uh, you know, with if you're clever enough to combine the right kinds of information, that you could provide insights to uh, groundwater and surface water users about uh, how they could make cost-effective upgrades um, or reschedule irrigation in a way that would make sense uh, for them. Thanks. How about? financial and economic instruments. What, what are those instruments that could actually help us better predict or manage in an uncertain water future or just water resources more generally? I think, well, I mean, and Raquel talks about it more, but pricing matters. I mean, yeah. uh, we have a whole agenda we're doing with something called the High Level Panel for Water, which has a bunch of heads of state who are sort of friendly to the idea of or, or recognizing the water challenges. One of the major pieces of that is uh, we can't call it water pricing because that's too political. Like I said, the, the demand side isn't there yet. Um, so we're calling it the va valuing water. And it's just trying to build this sense that you know, water is not free. Yes, it comes out of the sky, but in order, you know, it, it has a value because it's scarce. And you know, anybody who's taken their first year of economics knows that scarcity is what creates the whole concept of economics. And, and, and there is something, everything we've heard today says that in many parts of the world, there is scarcity. So, um, we would like to see more pricing, uh, both from a financial perspective, so that innovations are encouraged and, and can, the cost can be recovered. And then eventually, if it can get to the point where the, the scarcity value is captured, so that some of the decisions on, on uh, trade-offs can, can happen through markets and other mechanisms, that would be fantastic. And that would also then drive the financing of the sector as well, both because there would be the financial returns, but also there would be the innovation around the economic pricing. So uh, we think you know, this whole idea of valuing water is really important, even if it is challenging. Yeah, I'd add to that. You know, I think that uh, markets are a really great tool for uh, improving the value of water. Um, I, uh, I think one common misconception is that water is free. And so you know, a lot of people uh, you know, sort of talk about, even in the United States, oh, you don't pay for water. Um, usually it gets uh, capitalized into the value of the land, um, or you pay uh, assessment fees in your irrigation district. Uh, certainly the pumping costs can be enormous. And uh, in the panhandle of Texas, you saw people eventually stop irrigating because it became too expensive once uh, commodities prices tanked for corn. Um, so th there are ways in which people do pay for water. Um, but we, that's not to say that we can't do better. And so markets are a really useful instrument, um, both for handling the kinds of economic conditions that we have today, but also uh, how conditions might change in the future. Markets allow people to reallocate water resources amongst themselves uh, in space and time. And so you, know, you might have economic conditions today that say uh, you know, corn is not 
a high value crop, but that could change in the future. Or you could see uh, water resources move towards um, different cropping patterns. Um, I'd say too that um, in addition to thinking about markets that we can think about other uh, financial tools like crop insurance. Um, and so these are ways in which we can make improvements both in the developed world. So for example, there are very few uh, crop insurance programs that support uh, supplemental or limited irrigation. So there might be uh, areas in which you have uh, such a, a binding allocation or such a limited amount of water that your crop isn't fully irrigated. But normally uh, our crop insurance programs are binary. So you either insure a a uh, dryland crop or an irrigated crop. Um, well, these people who, uh, these producers who are uh, working with supplemental irrigation are completely left out then of crop insurance, um, or they're working on um, working with dryland uh, insurance programs that are less than optimal. Then we can also think about uh, index insurance in uh, the developing world. Um, and so there are uh, uh, there are many, I think that in addition to thinking about markets, we can think of um, other financial tools that can help uh, producers deal with uncertainty and water risk. I have one more question before I turn it over to the audience for Q&A, so just wanted to prep you for that. Um, the last area that I want to explore before we turn it over um, is policy and governance. So we've brought up several times the idea of governments being critical in preparing for a future water what is, what is the role of governance and policy, and, and actually what are the steps that need to be taken in order to help us sort of make the system more rigorous for an uncertain risk? I will quickly say that uh, both with water markets and kind of these policy changes, that's one area that technology cannot lead the charge. Um, I think a misconception is that you can throw together a Craigslist for water rights and all of a sudden you have a water market, uh, but it's extremely complex, uh, which I found out through working with Rochelle. Um, and it requires a, like really deep relationships with the people managing the water, an understanding of the individual users and their patterns of use. Um, and so I think the policy needs to enable the technological advances. And I think um, you know, working really closely with the policymakers and folks who are designing these water markets is uh, crucial for any technology to have success. I'd also add that, um, I guess in my experience of working in water markets, that institutions either uh, are doing too little or too much in the way of water governance. So you, know, you see um, groups that are unwilling to monitor and enforce water rights that are on the books. They are completely unwilling to enforce laws that are already on the books. And sometimes it just takes um, the, the change of saying, yes, we will now regulate. We will now enforce these rules. Uh, there are other places where uh, I would say that they're either over-regulated or that they're also creeping into the private sector a bit. Uh, so as an example, uh, you know, water markets, while they're very important to uh, monitor and enforce um, to verify that water rights are um, being uh, used by buyers and when you know the sellers relinquish them that they're not continuing to irrigate and sort of uh, use that water twice uh, that sometimes those regulatory institutions will also want to manage the market themselves um, but th that's I would say that that's a private sector role and that there are conflicts of interest in both managing the water resource and matching the buyers and sellers of the resource that you're regulating. Um, and so that can really distort uh, participation in the market and um, equity, quite frankly. Um, so I, you know, I have sort of seen either <laughs> too much or too little, and some people uh, or some institutions strike it just right. Uh, but I think that the, the role of uh, institutions is uh, clearly monitoring, enforcing, uh, uh, providing a clear and transparent accounting system. Uh, I really believe in local governance, though I think that it has to have enough oversight so that uh, you know, the, the local players aren't stacking the rules in a way that only benefits them. So those are some of the insights that I'd suggest for uh, uh, policy and governance. Do we have questions in the audience? Sure, do you wanna grab the mic? 
So hello, my name is Omar, and I'm actually from Kuwait. So my question is uh, to Mr. Schoenberger. First of all, I'd like to agree with what you said. Um, it is absolutely true that growing up, I had no idea of how uncertain the water is. And uh, citing a paper that was written in 2013, Kuwait is actually the highest consumer of water per capita. And it's crazy because it's double what it is in the UK. Wow. And I don't think we have a better quality of life, so it doesn't make sense. There's no correlation. Um, other than that, a lot of the money that is, that is spent on the desalination and electric production, that's about, it makes up about a third of the uh, revenues from the oil. And 95% of the revenues, 95 of the country's revenues are from oil. So you can see that this is a big issue. And right now, I think the government's approach to it is just let's find more efficient desalination technology. And that's not always the best solution moving forward. It could be part of the solution, but it will definitely not solve all the issues. So my question is, is this an issue that the citizens themselves, like um, the university student advocates, they should make people more, more aware of that? Or is that a more of a government policy issue? Or sh will we even in the future see, I don't know if this exists, but kind of like a Paris Agreement, kind of like a water mandate kind of thing, mm -hmm. just so they, they tell countries that are like Kuwait in a sense, saying, hey, what you're doing is absolutely terrible. You can't do that. It's a global issue. It's not just your issue. And we need to start seeing a solution. I mean, I would say it's all of the above, right? I mean, <laughs> but uh, it really, it was music to my ears when you said about you know, sort of citizens. Exactly what you're saying is something we're trying to do in the Middle East is working at three levels because uh, our vice president came to me, he's from Egypt, and he came to me and he said, listen, I know that water is really a big issue in this region. Of course, there were other things going on in the region the last three to four years, so we have to give the leaders a bit of a break. But uh, he said, you know, we know it's a really important issue, but when I go to speak with ministers of finance or heads of state, they never raise it. They might raise education, they might raise this, that, but they never raise water as an issue. And he says, we've, we've got to do something to get it there because everybody knows it's important. So we tried working at kind of the three levels you've just mentioned. We, we, we tried working at the political level to try and bring more awareness, sort of naming and shaming across heads of state, et cetera, not quite a Paris agreement. It's been tough because the regional organizations haven't been as strong as we'd hoped on this. They're trying as well. But that's, yes, that's one element. And I think that's worth doing. And this work we're doing with the high level panel on water is meant to go a bit in that direction, get heads of state sort of making these declarations. Second level is the technical level. Um, because of this lack of re recognizing that this is an existential challenge for the planet, for regions, et cetera. The exchange, we've been shocked by how little exchange of technical knowledge there is often between the practitioners, whether they're in the agricultural community or the uh, urban utility community. And so we've tried to bring practitioners together a bit more, both within the Middle East and North Africa region, but also just globally around some of these issues. Uh, and then thirdly, and I think this actually came from a one of, uh, a member of one of the royal families of the Middle East said, you know, and this was three or four years ago, he said, you know, everybody is so focused on what's happening with the other conflicts in the region that, you know, this isn't the moment we're going to get the, the heads of state to take the, the leadership. But he said, we have to build what he called a new water consciousness. And it's exactly what you're saying. It's really getting young people and others to really say, hey, we're concerned about this because it's our future. And there's no reason we can't do better. And in essence, provide the, both the push and the courage for the leadership to take that while ensuring that the technical level also isn't pushing back because they realize they have the tools if they get the green light from above. So I think really we have to work at all three levels that you just mentioned and the way you articulated it was right on the money. To, to add to that is some other work that I've been in, involved in the Nile and the, the whole role of media is really important in this. And there, there is a program at, at MIT and a couple other universities on environmental journalism and how you communicate the truths of water. And there's a lot of um, misconceptions about water. And it's continued on through the media. And an, an example is what's going on on the Nile with the, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam that the Ethiopians are building. And if you read some of the um, papers in Egypt, the worst thing is going to ever happen in the world. And they will be destroyed during the filling of that. It's a very serious issue, but there are they're saying 65% of their GDP will be lost for a year. And we've done the analysis, and it's less than one half of 1%. 
Now that doesn't mean it isn't important and there isn't damages, but let's put it in prospect. The problem in Egypt is 60% of the farmers are, are of the employees have been farmers. And if they're hurt, it'll have political implication. So the Stockholm Water Environment Institute are getting journalists in the region to go and visit and talk about these things so we can get the truth out. Because if you go to Ethiopia, they say that's our water, you just stealing it from, you go to Egypt, they're gonna kill us. So we have to have this um, getting, becoming water literate because we can make some really serious problems if we don't understand um, what's going on. Are there other questions? Here we go. Yeah, I wanted uh, the other panelists to also expound on your point, because I feel this panel gathers a group of people that uh, speak to different stakeholders, but also use different mediums to communicate a very complex topic. Uh, I'm personally very invested in the idea that maps offer a very illuminating perspective and you bring together sociopolitical and ecological issues for water, but since you're all working on different mediums. I'm, I'm wondering if you have stories for how, or m modes of storytelling that you have found more compelling and more convincing when it comes to communicating with students or policymakers or practitioners or farmers down in the, yeah, on the ground. That's a great question. Uh, one of my uh, favorite activities is that we, so there are tons, there are tons of misconceptions about water markets out there. And so one of the um, biggest jobs I've found that I've had, or one of the ways in which I spend most of my time is uh, uh, fighting those various misconceptions and you know, sort of breaking those down. And so one of my favorite activities is that um, uh, we developed a game that teaches people the different ways uh, that you can actually trade water in practice. Uh, so it's through bilateral negotiation or through uh, you know, posting posting on a bulletin board or through smart markets or reverse auctions or regular auctions. And so I get a group together and sometimes they've been as small as five and as large as uh, 200, I think was my biggest group. And that was a mess. I would not recommend that to anybody. But the <laughs> point is uh, games are a great way to help people think about uh, some of these issues. And so you know, whether you're talking about groundwater and can get some marbles in a jar and talk about uh, pulling them out and how much you how many extra you might take in a drought year and how many you put in through recharge or you're uh, uh, trading water with each other uh, there I think games are a really great tool um, but this is certainly an area that uh, you know I would I would love the input of uh, you know colleagues who are really great in uh, journalism and marketing and you know it's not an area of expertise of mine but I think it's some it's a way in which uh, uh, those of us in water resources could really use a lending hand. And so, you know, I think as we become more and more interdisciplinary, making sure that we don't leave out uh, our communications folks, you know, is, is critical. I've done her game and it's illuminating. Like truly, you don't understand how complex water markets are until you've experienced them and tried to sell your virtual water rate. Um, <laughs> I, to, map, to the point of maps, uh, one thing that the organizations we work with are most excited about is uh, not only do they get this automated monitoring system, but they now have this website that they could send to their stakeholders, right? Uh, so uh, there's a, a program called Bird Returns where they pay rice farmers to shift pa uh, schedules of irrigation to make it more habitable to migratory birds. And they were doing the same thing, driving to the fields every couple of days. Um, and at first, we thought the biggest payoff for them was that they've automated their monitoring. They no longer have to drive to the fields. They can go to our website and see all the different programs on a map and interact with them. Uh, but as it turns out, the biggest benefit to them was being able to share that with the board members of the Nature Conservancy and the investors who are making that possible, because now they have that feedback loop, which is like, look at this tangible benefit. You could look at the true color imagery and see how the habitat is changing and becoming more uh, hospitable to the species. And so using very visual kind of real-time communication methods also seem to be closing feedback loops to get more funding uh, to, for these cool projects. Your, your point, really this is something we're struggling with because as I just mentioned, we're trying to work at these different stakeholder levels and that's just three and there's probably many, many more. And you do need different skills and approaches to having effective dialogue and communication. And that's been really tough for us because you know we're sort of traditionally with the policymakers, 
And you know, I've spent over 20 years doing that, so I'm pretty good at that. But you know, last uh, World Water Day, we had an event uh, for the, the Middle East North Africa region. Well, it was a Mediterranean thing. It was in Marseille. And we had the um, World uh, Youth Water Parliament people there, et cetera. And they had me do some stuff, et cetera. And the president of it, I think her name's Asma, came up to me afterwards and fired me because she said I was so terrible at communicating with her constituency. Oh, no. <laughs> she said, you know, you were boring. You went on with these charts and this and that and, you know, et cetera. And she was right. I mean, it, it, you're right. You do need different ways of communicating. And that's something, uh, I don't want to say, yeah, we're learning. We're not struggling with, but we're learning as we go. Because I'm pretty good in front of a minister of finance or a minister of water, minister of ag. I kind of know which buttons to push and what kind of gets them interested in most cases. But you know, put me in front of the general public or, or, or another group, and you know, I don't, just don't have the tools for it. So we're trying to figure out how we sort of have the right people on board to work with those different groups, which is a bit pushing the boundaries of how our institution works, but that's fun. We have another question. Yeah. Um, so uh, over this past summer, well, we talked a little bit about uh, how this is a business risk and how businesses will presumably act to mitigate these risks. Um, this summer, I had an opportunity to look at some sort of large multinational food businesses. And some of them have pro programs where they're working with farmers and trying to um, get them to adopt crop um, water or drought resistant crops. Uh, other ones, however, had tools to hedge against commodity prices or buy insurance that, at least as I'm seeing it, don't seem to be increasing the food system's resilience to an uncertain water future. And I was just wondering if there's anything that you guys can speak to in terms of if they're not the ones who are uh, you know, feeling the effects of this, who are they passing it along to? And then also, how can you get people, um, businesses to do the stuff that actually is increasing resilience as opposed to sort of mitigating their own risk through financial tools or other mechanisms? That's, uh, yeah, another great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the more that we can uh, spread our risk through uh, more flexible policy, more flexible financial tools, um, you know, so, so policy and thinking about incentive-based tools or you know, ways to reward conservation, to install best management practices, to reallocate water resources, uh, financial tools being hedging those financial risks, uh, getting crop insurance, um, diversifying your crops, diversify and you know, for these larger uh, companies, even being able to diversify the uh, geographic scope of uh, where you've invested, um, the, the better that we can cope then with um, this kind of risk. Um, I think that it, it varies in terms of who then takes on that risk. Sometimes there are ways in which uh, just an, an individual producer is able to um, uh, spread, spread that risk around. And sometimes uh, maybe that risk is um, uh, spread more at this you know, sort of multinational company, but uh, the, is less, there are less benefits that go to the individual producers. And so I do think that that's an important question, not just thinking about uh, aggregate risk, but also the distributional effects too. But that's not one I've figured out. I mean, your point about, you know, that's the whole game of supply chains, right, is pushing, shoving risk around back and forth. And that's what everybody does. And that's sort of what's behind, you know, that's the game. But uh, as you say, I think that's where someone asked about the role, you asked about the role of public policy. That's one of the roles potentially of public policy is really, particularly if you're talking about smallholders, is trying to come up with mechanisms that kind of push back a little bit uh, that risk, or try and ensure a risk sharing mechanism instead of, as you say, just kind of third, you know, putting it out there on the third party. And again, I, I think some of these uh, stewardship initiatives by some of the, the, the companies, some of which are sponsoring this event, um, is, is really promising. I mean, there they've made a commitment to try and work together with the farmers. It tends to work for the high value commodities because there's an interest of the company to ensure that supply chain doesn't work as well for the commodities. I heard some one of the speakers mention they're doing some work with commodities because there's a lot of it out there. You don't need to do it. It's not a business. It's not the same kind of business risk. So I, I, I think maybe the frontier is on how we start to build that into the commodity, the, the more the commodity crops as, as a way. Because I think on some of the high value crops, I mean, certainly on things like cocoa and coffee, et cetera, it's coming along pretty quickly. It's, it's really the, commo the uh, big commodity crops where you, you see less of it and where you see more public intervention. And water markets in general help 
mitigate risk in a way, right? Because those most averse to the risk can purchase a water right or buy something like a drought option. You could start creating instruments around uh, water markets where a city purchases drought options where in a drought year, the, a place that needs the water the most has the option um, and that creates new revenue streams for those who are not as risk averse. I think there are interesting mechanisms that could be explored once markets are functioning more broadly. I think it's something that always comes to the end of these panels and when we're sitting down here many times is it comes to values. And I'd like to challenge the group to, to think about, we, we talk about food security, we talk about food self-sufficiency. Um, what are we trying to deal with? Because some of these are, we're in the, the market and, and maybe we'll talk about that some more tomorrow. But in working in, in a current project in, in the Zambezi Basin of eight countries, um, there's a focus entirely on commercial and large scale irrigation. And we call it the invisible 60%, which are the subsistence rain fed farmers. And they're not getting any attention from the government, from the stakeholders. And if we looked at how we would allocate water, what are we trying to do as we, as we do that? How can we address the issues of, of food? And then there's this, this issue that one of my colleagues talked about is this balance that most subsistence farmers live on the edge. Sometimes they have surplus, they'd like to get to the market, and other times they have a drought. And how do we get, how do we protect them and coming up with mechanisms, which is what are we trying to solve? And then the whole issue of, you know, how do we deal with this in terms of capital in addressing the issue of hunger or poverty versus economic growth, and those are all on are the same, and they're really hard to, to, to deal with. And, and the bank is dealing with that all the time, is where do the, where do the funds go and how do you deal with that? So um, we have to address the problem and what we're trying to do. And many times it comes to a value issue of what we're trying to solve. Next question. Um, yeah, so this is a question mainly for Professor Stresbeck, um, based on something you said earlier about rapid urbanization um, and how this is an incredible challenge that we'll be facing in the future. Um, you know, there's this conflict between uh, urban environments and agriculture. And so you said that there are different ways uh, potentially of supplying the water that um, cities will need uh, compared to business as usual. I was just asking, wondering if you could go into some more detail about what those different ways might be. Okay, so in short, I, I would say look at some of the things Singapore is doing, what Hong Kong is doing. And in, in those for the urban, one of the big things is gray water. And in, in Hong Kong, they actually use seawater for flushing of toilets. And then they use gray water to add to the seawater and rainwater harvesting and looking at that. Um, and then there is, in Singapore, the new water, which is true water reuse. So the big issue in China is we, if you have your urban at the end of the river basin, it has to pass. And what was a really good point is, even though you use 80% of it, if you're 50% efficient, 40% of that water is still there. But if you're getting all that water at the coast, you have to let it go. So where, the, where your city is matters. So the geography, the hydrogeography is important. And so you're not going to ship that water back up to, to irrigate. So as you, as you build it together, building standards, um, low flow toilets, um, going to these, these systems, because Hong Kong in the 60s were very desperate. So they put in desperate measures. And again, but the government still subsidizes. The water prices are way below what they should be for their condition. So thinking about things, particularly urban drainage is a really big area, particularly in many developing countries as we're getting the mega cities and we're just letting sprawl and we're not dealing with this issue of flooding and which leads to disease and other things of getting the water away. But the gray water, water reuse, which has cultural and social implications that some people aren't wanting to do that, using it for peri-urban agriculture for for fruits and vegetables, but um, and even thinking about growth in the bigger terms of where you locate your urban areas, so that you can be in a, a balance with with the water and as it goes to the sea. So um, that's why Denver's happy to be high in in the mountains. I don't know any thoughts in the agricultural area in cities. Uh, I think your point on 
being able to use gray water or treated gray water in agriculture is really nice. So there, there's a great example, I think, in Ventura County in California where uh, the, the county sends its treated wastewater to uh, agricultural lands. And then ag lands actually pump groundwater and send it into the city. So they've got this really unique kind of water market or trade that's going on between these uh, two different sectors that are um, sitting side by side. Yeah, and a technical example, the town of Thornton in Colorado bought a water right from agriculture on the Cache La Puta River 50 miles away, and they had to build two pipes. One brought the water in, and then they had to return the treated wastewater back. So they really only used 10% of that water, and then they got it back and they got their purposes. So those kind of creative solutions, um, I think are things we need to do and, and think differently. The, there's some thinking up out there of going back to uh, night soils and, and going to dry, uh, dry sanitation and what that would mean and, and all in between. So those are the sort of technical solutions we may be able to come up with help the urban area. You are seeing a lot of uh, water right transfers to cities. I think that's one of the uh, biggest buyers in certain areas like Sacramento. Um, they're buying massive amounts of water from irrigation districts, um, sometimes a, a yearly lease. Um, but the interesting thing about that relationship is you see those transfers pop up in years where it's just not economically viable to grow a certain crop. Um, and you end up making sometimes more money via leasing the water to the city than you would otherwise. So. Thank you. I think we have a question on the side. Hi, we've talked a lot about water availability and as the world gets more crowded and polluted, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the safety of water and how uncertain that is and if there's ways that technology can help ensure that water stays safe. I think uh, looking at best management practices on farms across broad regions and understanding, uh, you know, how widespread are practices that lead to more nutrient runoff or, or you know, refuse entering the waterways? Um, you know, monitoring temperature of water is a big thing, right? And that's, that's pretty easy to do uh, from space. We could tell from a surface water body what the temperature is. And so seeing increases in temperature is really important to keep a look at, especially for our species in those freshwater ecosystems. Um, those are the two that pop out to me. Yeah. I, th I think the previous panel was superb on that issue, but I think just in terms of, as I was trying, I, maybe I need to emphasize more, is that is the emerging issue in, in developing countries as, that has not been sufficiently, I mean, we've looked at sanitation quite a bit, but really the overall water quality issue is part of the sort of water development in the developing world, at least from the, the, the uh, finan international financial institutions and others, hasn't gotten the attention it needs to. Part of what's helping to improve that is the focus on aquifers because everyone's concerned about the contamination of aquifers now. So that's starting to bring a little more attention, but that's certainly sort of where the expansion of, of, of knowledge work is going to be over the next 10 years in terms of how water and development uh, intersect. Yeah, I think this is both an information and a governance problem. I mean, <laughs> Flint, Michigan still does not have clean water and this is happening in the United States. Uh, I think that we need to, th and of course, Flint is not alone in uh, places where we have unsafe drinking water. So, uh, you know, I think it's in part a governance issue and in part an information challenge that we need to um, have uh, have pe people be able to know information about their their water and uh, its safety. Uh, uh, that that information needs to be more accessible to them and that there needs to be more accountability with that as well. It raises a, a good question of sort of current mismanagement versus future res re resilience, right? So how much of the issue is current mismanagement and readying the current system versus actually doing something more and innovative, which I think we need both, but resiliency versus sort of the current resource management. I think, you know, in most countries, in this country certainly, and even in many of the developing countries, the laws are on the books, the regulations are there, et cetera. I was talking to someone during the break. I mean, the problem is there are certain countries you go there, they've got the standards, they've adopted WHO or whatever standard that's out there, and you go and the wastewater treatment plants are not operating as they're supposed to be. So you can keep investing in the technology, investing in the technology, but 
you know, there is a need for a regulatory action there, as, as uh, Raquel was, was, was emphasizing. You do need the government to play its role in terms of enforcing those, those standards. Otherwise, we can keep investing, whether it's in technology or in standard traditional systems, and we're not going to get there. Great, thank you. Hello. Um, we've been, I want, my question is about the food production. Uh, we started today saying how it accounts for 70% of the water use. And I want to know your thoughts about the waste, because a third of all the food that is produced goes to waste before it's used. So how do you see through technology or policy, um, instead of like trying to make production more effective and like increase it, and use less water to actually optimize this um, produce to demand. And what do you think about it? Great question. So looking at the, the actual food side of the system, so instead of thinking about the water resources, how do we actually affect change on, on the food supply side? They, they never waste irrigated food. It's only rain fed. Now, I think uh, you will talk about that tomorrow, Mark, food waste. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if you, in your agriculture work, it's not no, my I mean, well, The only things I'll add, and again, IFPRI's done some great work on it, and Mark will probably contradict everything I say tomorrow, but, <laughs> and listen to him, because they've done much more work on it. But I mean, two things. One, there's this magic number in the world of food waste, the 30%. It's been 30% forever, OK? And every time there's a food price crisis, or a water issue, or whatever, everybody says, we've got to reduce food waste. And yet it doesn't seem to, either it's, it's moving, and nobody's recording it, because there hasn't been very good analysis, real analysis of it, you know, this, uh, I think there's one or two studies that I've seen that have really tried to really follow this through, one by Erie. Um, but so, you know, the magic 30% number seems to be out there and doesn't seem to move. What, what's kind of interesting, though, in this is that, uh, you know, the, this, this, the numbers sort of suggest that in developing countries, most of that food waste is at the farm level. So it's lost, it's post-harvest losses. And in Higher income countries, it's mostly at the consumer level. We buy a bunch of food and we let it rot in our refrigerator and throw it away, or we go and we order too much at the restaurant or whatever. And so, you know, there are different problems for different groups. And again, that doesn't answer your question about how you deal with it, but it's just to say that we, I guess my, we need to dig in much more in terms of really understanding how it works, why with all, what we, one would think are all the incentives throughout the supply chains to address this, because it's like free food in a way. If you can address it, it's not happening. What's wrong with the economics of supply chains that it seems OK to have 30% shrinkage uh, through the system? Uh, but again, I'll, I'll defer to Mark and build up the drum roll for his presentation tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so we have time for maybe two more questions. So the folks that are standing there, we'll take those and then we'll do some closing thoughts. Um, thank you very much for all your thoughts. It's been really interesting um, hearing the diversity and I wanted to put something out there that I don't think has been covered. Um, there's a concept of, especially post um, extreme events, which I appreciated the wording rather than natural disasters. What is the discourse on this concept of retreat within your sectors in terms of water scarcity and um, water emergencies. Is it something that's in the discourse with regards to agri agriculture? Because in the urban planning, built environment discourse, there's an increasing this idea that instead of um, build back better, you retreat, rebuild. And I was wondering if that's something that comes up in agriculture in the different sectors that you work in, or if that's something that's not quite there yet. This is new to me. Uh, would you describe a little bit more about what retreat means? Uh, unless anyone else on the panel understands this. So example would be from sea level rise. Rather than build a seawall, you move your community back. So you retreat from the threat. So part, I think maybe in agriculture would be let's, and there is some of this, let's move out of a sector that is at risk and put our resources into another sector. So move away from um, irrigated agriculture and move into industry and maybe go to rain fed or changing to high value crops and import your food. So there could be, I can see sectoral retreat and, and partial retreat in some of those, or resilience is let's go irrigate and build dams and do those things. So it's more of an urban, uh, urban uh, planning kind of concept, but it's interesting um, as we think of adaptation and climate change, and the, the bank has done a lot of work, 
there is retreat. You don't keep doing the same thing all the time if it's not going to be economical. And do we move to other sectors or other ideas? I know um, we've worked jointly on a project like that in MENA. I, I mean, I hear that they're growing wine grapes in the UK now. Yeah. So that's, uh, <laughs> they're retreating from Bordeaux, I yes. suppose, a little bit. Uh, so uh, no, I mean, I, I think what we're looking at is exactly that. Globally or on a regional basis, how will the production patterns change? And it, it's not that you'll stop growing. I think at this stage, we're not talking about stopping growing in most cases, except some extreme examples where it's really pumping fossil groundwater. And does that continue to make sense? That trade-off between food security or food self-sufficiency and, and, and water security. Um, but you know that how you change what you grow. So I guess the retreat is maybe a little different, possibly in agriculture. I would put out there. I also hadn't really thought about it. It's really interesting. But the retreat is maybe changing what you grow and adjusting to something that makes more sense given the inherent what you think will be the long-term climate dynamics uh, in the area where you're growing, and and that would be your retreat. Is that that change of of what you produce? But uh, I don't know, Ken, if that's something. Yeah. And what are, just to follow up on that, what are the time scales on which you can make those sort of decisions? Because something like crop choice, that, that's a longer term decision framework, correct? Well, crops can be short term. I know um, in Northeast Colorado where my uh, in-law family are, I've talked to farmers and they have either wheat or corn on their equipment and they tend not to have both. And so they, there's a life of that before they're going to switch. If the prices go up, they don't immediately switch to another crop. So there is some inertia in the systems. But if they continually see that corn's going down, they'll switch and do the investment over. But then, that, so there's some rigidness and stickiness in the system. It isn't like us economic models where we switch them every, every year. That doesn't happen so much. So there, it's that. But if you're going to irrigate, that's a longer term. You need the investment that's coming back out of that. Or you're going to put in orchards, or you're going to sell it to a developer to put in homes. Those kind of things are. One other retreat um, that I've noticed isn't quite agriculture, but it's definitely water, is from large scale hydro in certain regions. Um, you're noticing those being replaced by small scale distributed hydropower. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a large retreat, right? Because we poured money into those big dams. Um, and now we're realizing the ramifications of that complex system and retreating from that choice. Final question. Thank you. Um, it was mentioned previously that there are many uh, issues with regards to laws. There are a lot of laws in the books, but they are not always implemented. So how do you deal with enforcement, especially um, if you're a developing country or if you're in California and there are events of extreme environmental stress? I mean, we count a lot on yeah. <laughs> uh, transparency. I mean, it's, it's basically creating social pressure. Is, is transparency is really important. We talked about, uh, I, I don't like uh, sort of education, but more just awareness, public awareness. Uh, you know, people have to care, right? I mean, there's lots of laws on the book that aren't in, enforced, and frankly, they don't affect you. They don't affect me on a day-to-day -day basis. So we don't really care whether the government enforces them. They may have long-term impacts. They may have impacts on other people, but you know, you and I aren't going to necessarily use up our time and voice to, to, to push government to, to demand their enforcement. So we have to make it personal for everybody that this matters. and. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm always, maybe you asked about the difference between developing country and developed countries. I guess one thing that I found, and it's a little bit of a segue, but I found really fascinating is when you go to the Midwest, uh, whether it's true or not, you constantly hear farmers say, I'm doing this because I want to leave the land and the water for my kids and future generations. And you go to some developing countries, a lot actually, and you say, you know, what about the future? And they're like, the last thing I want to see my son or daughter do is farm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay, these are the smaller farmers, and in the US, they're, you know, they've got a pretty good middle class life, so I, I get it. But, you know, you have to always have that in mind. You know, what, what do people want to see happen in the future? That, that, that motivates them. But so I think, you know, you just have to back up from that and say, okay, if groundwater is important, we have to convince people that this thing that you don't see, that we know less about than we know about the surface of Mars, is important enough for them to make a lot of noise. In California, we spoke to one of the lawyers who was involved in the recent groundwater legislation, which extraordinarily California was the 50th 
state, with all of its innovation, uh, to come up with a groundwater law, the very last one in the state. Well, there was a reason for it, because agricultural interests didn't want a groundwater law, and they're very powerful there. But what happened, things got so bad during the drought with the pumping that some of the more, uh, some of the corporates and others got really worried about some of the sustainability issues that others have raised. And so they broke ranks, and then that provided the opportunity to bring in a groundwater law. So you know, somebody's got to feel it's important enough to, to break ranks or speak up, et cetera. So I think this is where researchers and, and others can start to pull that information and put it in front of people and say, look, this is what happens if we don't, if we don't enforce this. And on the SGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, like, OK, you have this legislation. And to your question, how do you enforce it? Right? There are a lot of farms. And uh, you know, having people hire groups or, or consultants to do an assessment on each farm is impossible, right? So you have to figure out how to make that reporting process, if reporting is required, as seamless as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and thankfully, groups like USDA are doing conservation innovation grants to help uh, fund that. We're actually doing one for the SGMA to make reporting easier. Um, but it's, it takes a whole nother you know, group to make sure that the those requirements are met so that reporting isn't just forgotten. Right? In Texas, where they require reporting, you look at their documentation and there are like decade-long gaps where you know, every year the, the grower reported 100 acre feet. And it's like, are you really pumping exactly, precisely 100 acre feet? Probably not. <laughs> it's probably OK. But you know, so making the reporting easier and more seamless um, I think is a really important um, important kind of aspect to enforcement. Well, thank, thank you, you guys. Th those were fantastic questions. I do want to end with some closing thoughts from our panel. So we've explored this rather large topic, the uncertain water future at the intersection of a rather large topic itself, food and water. For us as water practitioners, what are some of your sort of final thoughts or closing recommendations on how we should think about um, how we approach the uncertainty of both or all of all of the items that we've talked today, right? So there's uncertainty in our geopolitical system. There's uncertainty in our water resources, in our food system. As water practitioners who care a lot about this, what are some of your closing recommendations for us? In order, OK. <laughs> you can go down the line so, again. Um, I think what we have to do is, is today is step back. I think we're a little aquacentric here today because that's the tone. But when you go and look at development, I've spent the last 10 years working with development economics and seeing the role of infrastructure, both particularly water and urban, in, in growth and the whole issue of push or pull. But when you go to see where the decisions are made, when, when you go to the World Bank, it's a loan and they have to pay it back. And so that's the future generations have to pay that back. The Ministry of Finance wants to know that that, that is a useful loan that they're going to take. And so the debate comes on, where do we put it in? And do we put it in, in education? Do we put it in energy? Do we put it in transport? And the problem with water and food, it, it's very low valued from an economic point of view. So we have to deal with this on the level of the, 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 the growth and sustainable growth and economic growth and work on it at that level and some of its values. And we won't like it sometimes to see the way money is being spent or how the loans are being done. So we have to work in that context and it becomes values that we have to bring in. And some of the work we've been doing is trying to show that some of these invisible investments actually have long-term gains by, for example, if you bring in a village water supply system, what it allows to do is primarily girls to go to school. Well, that means in 10 years there's a reward because you have better productivity of a labor force. And that can come and, and, and have economic value. Or protecting a wetland. A wetland protects against floods. It has habitat, it has livelihood. That has GDP value. So trying to show the ministries of finance and the ministries of economy and planning that investments in the water sector and the ag sector do have long-term benefits but um, and, and talk on their currency. So it really is a matter of value. And on the other side is, Capital is short, and so we need to impact investing. We need to talk with our governments and get them to be influenced for us to be um, more open with sharing and taking risks ourselves and investing in things that may have a, 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 some, some uncertainty there as, as we go forward. But um, the, the work of the World Bank just 
part of it. We have to do a lot across the, the government policies to, to help there be economic growth and sustainable growth, but not to forget some of the sectors and particularly um, hunger and poverty. How do we bring those together? I, I think, again, the, the new, I, I liked very much what I learned from someone I admired very much was that new water consciousness, I think, is really, I just encourage that we all really do it, whether we're economists or, or scientists, engineers, journalists, whatever, that we, if we believe this is an important issue, that we take it forward. And I believe it's important, and I think, you know, sort of the standard we should go by is assuming that my colleagues' econometrics is correct, the fact that a one-time drought can disadvantage two, three generations in a poor country. That you know, the girls will not go to school as long, that their children will not go to school as long, et cetera, they will be uh, nutritionally challenged, is, is extraordinary. I mean, that's just incredibly, it's just not acceptable. And that's gotta be what drives us. And if getting people to think about water, whether it's within their own communities or on a global scale, will help to bring around solutions to allow those, that not to keep happening, then it's worth it. So I just urge us all to keep working on that basis. Um, I guess in the MIT entrepreneurial spirit, I didn't go to MIT, but I think Rochelle and I are examples of the opportunity that exists in this space. Uh, and I think if you have a skill set that you know, gives you a unique perspective within uh, water, um, be it with technology or policy or journalism or whatever it is, I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space specifically uh, to have a, a large impact. Um, and the best thing about this community is that everyone kind of helps each other succeed, be it through you know, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center or just collaborating with people you meet at conferences like this. And so I think just if you see a, glim a glimmer of some opportunity, I think uh, explore it and work with others that you meet uh, here or elsewhere to see if it's viable and if there's a need for it, because there probably is. Yeah, we could be doing better on many fronts from policy to data and tech and governance and financial instruments. So there, the opportunities for uh, innovation and improvement are limitless. Uh, I just always go back for my own inspiration to the stakeholders to really understand uh, what issues they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis, what's keeping them up at night, and how we can uh, make their lives better. And so I'd encourage uh, you to do the same. It's just spend some time with the people that you're trying to help. Great. That's a great way to end. Well, thank you guys for your time today. This was a great panel, um, and we're looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow. <laughs>